among the tales of sorrow and of ruin that come down to us from the darkness of those days, there are yet some in which amid weeping there is joy, and under the shadow of death light that endures. And of these histories, most fair still in the ears of the elves, is the tale of Baron and Luthien. Of their lives was made the lay of Lethian, release from bondage, which is the longest, save one of the songs concerning the world of old. But here the tale is told in fewer words, and without song. It has been told that Barahir would not forsake Dorthonian, and there Morgoth pursued him to the death, until at last there remained to him only twelve companions. Now the forest of Dorthonian rose southward into mountainous moors, and in the east of those highlands there lay a lake, Tarn Eiluin, with wild heaths about it. And all that land was pathless and untamed, for even in the days of the long peace none had dwelt there. But the waters of Tarn Eiluin were held in reverence, for they were clear and blue by day, and by night were a mirror for the stars. And it was said that Melian herself had hallowed that water in days of old. Thither Barhir and his outlaws withdrew, and there made their lair. And Morgoth could not discover it. But the rumour of the deeds of Barahir and his companions went far and wide, and Morgoth commanded Sauron to find them and destroy them. Now among the companions of Barahir was Gorlim, son of Ingrim. His wife was named Eilinel, and their love was great ere evil befell. But Gorlim, returning from the war upon the marches, found his house plundered and forsaken and his wife gone, whether slain or taken he knew not. Then he fled to Barahir, and of his companions he was the most fierce and desperate. But doubt gnawed his heart, thinking that perhaps Eilinu was not dead. At times he would depart alone and secretly, and visit his house that still stood amid the fields and woods he had once possessed. And this became known to the servants of Morgoth. On a time of autumn he came in the dusk of evening, and drawing near he saw as he thought a light at the window, and coming warily he looked within. There he saw Eilinel, and her face was worn with grief and hunger, and it seemed to him that he heard her voice lamenting that he had forsaken her. But even as he cried aloud, the light was blown out in the wind, wolves howled, and on his shoulders he felt suddenly the heavy hands of Sauron's hunters. Thus Gorlim was ensnared, and taking him to their camp, they tormented him, seeking to learn the hidings of Barahir and all his ways. But nothing would Gorlim tell. Then they promised him that he should be released and restored to Eilinel if he would yield, and being at last worn with pain, and yearning for his wife, he faltered. Then straightway they brought him into the dreadful presence of Sauron, and Sauron said, I hear now that thou wouldst barter with me. What is thy price? And Gorlam answered that he should find Eilinel again, and with her be set free for he thought that Eilinel also had been made captive. Then Sauron smiled, saying, That is a small price for so great a treachery. So shall it surely be. Say on. Now Gorlim would have drawn back, but daunted by the eyes of Sauron, he told at last all that he would know. Then Sauron laughed, and he mocked Gorlim and revealed to him that he had seen only a phantom devised by wizardry to entrap him, for Eilinel was dead. Nonetheless, I will grant thy prayer, said Sauron, and thou shalt go to Eilinel, and be set free of my service. 
then he put him cruelly to death. In this way the hiding of Barhir was revealed, and Morgoth drew his net about it, and the orcs coming in the still hours before dawn surprised the men of Dorthonian, and slew them all save one. For Beren, son of Barahir, had been sent by his father on a perilous errand to spy upon the ways of the enemy, and he was far afield when the lair was taken. But as he slept benighted in the forest, he dreamed that carrion birds sat thick as leaves upon bare trees beside a mere, and blood dripped from their beaks. Then Beren was aware in his dream of a form that came to him across the water, and it was a wraith of Gorlim, and it spoke to him declaring his treachery and death, and bade him make haste to warn his father. Then Beren awoke, and sped through the night, and came back to the lair of the outlaws on the second morning. But as he drew near, the carrion birds rose from the ground, and sat in the older trees beside Tarn Eilwyn and croaked in mockery. There Baron buried his father's bones, and raised a can of boulders above him, and swore upon it an oath of vengeance. First, therefore, he pursued the orcs that had slain his father and his kinsmen, and he found their camp by night at Rivu's well above the fen of Zarek, and because of his woodcraft he came near to their fire unseen, there their captain made boast of his deeds, and he held up the hand of Barahir that he had cut off as a token for Sauron, that their mission was fulfilled. And the ring of Felagund was on that hand. Then Beren sprang from behind a rock and slew the captain, and taking the hand and the ring he escaped, being defended by fate, for the orcs were dismayed and their arrows wild. Thereafter, for four years more, Beren wandered still upon Dorthonian, a solitary outlaw, but he became the friend of birds and beasts, and they aided him, and did not betray him, and from that time forth he ate no flesh nor slew any living thing that was not in the service of Morgoth. He did not fear death, but only captivity, and being bold and desperate he escaped both death and bonds, and the deeds of lonely daring that he achieved were noised abroad throughout Beleriand, and the tale of them came even into Doriath. At length Morgoth set a price upon his head no less than the price upon the head of Fingon, high king of the Noldor. But the orcs fled rather at the rumour of his approach than sought him out. Therefore an army was sent against him under the command of Sauron, and Sauron brought werewolves fell beasts inhabited by dreadful spirits that he had imprisoned in their bodies. All that land was now become filled with evil, and all clean things were departing from it, and Beren was pressed so hard that at last he was forced to flee from Dorthonian. In time of winter and snow he forsook the land and grave of his father and climbing into the high regions of Gorgoroth, the mountains of terror, he described afar off the land of Doriath. There it was put into his heart that he would go down into the hidden kingdom, where no mortal foot had yet trodden. Terrible was his southward journey. Sheer were the precipices of Edid Gorgoroth, and beneath their feet were shadows that were laid before the rising of the moon. Beyond lay the wilderness of Dungorthab, where the sorcery of Sauron and the power of Melion came together, and horror and madness walked. There spiders of the fell race of Ungoliant abode, spinning their unseen webs in which all living things were snared and monsters wandered there that were born in the long dark before the sun, hunting silently with many eyes. No food for elves or men was there in that haunted land, but death only. That journey is not accounted least among the great deeds of Beren, 
but he spoke of it to no one after, lest the horror return into his mind. And none know how he found a way, and so came by paths that no man nor elf else ever dared to tread to the borders of Doriath. And he passed through the mazes that Melian wove about the kingdom of Thingol, even as she had foretold, for a great doom lay upon him. It is told in the Lay of Lethian that Baron came stumbling into Doriath, grey and bowed, as with many years of woe, so great had been the torment of the road. But wandering in the summer in the woods of Neldereth, he came upon Luthien, daughter of Thingu and Melian, at a time of evening under moonrise, as she danced upon the unfading grass in the glade beside Esgalduin. Then all memory of his pain departed from him, and he fell into an enchantment, for Luthien was the most beautiful of all the children of Iluvatar. Blue was her raiment as the unclouded heaven, but her eyes were grey as the starlit evening. Her mantle was sown with golden flowers, but her hair was dark as the shadows of twilight, as the light upon the leaves of the trees, as the voice of clear waters, as the stars above the mists of the world. Such was her glory and her loveliness, and in her face was a shining light. But she vanished from his sight, and he became dumb, as one that is bound under a spell, and he strayed long in the woods, wild and wary as a beast, seeking for her. In his heart he called her Tenuvio, that signifies Nightingale, daughter of twilight, in the grey elven tongue, for he knew no other name for her. And he saw her afar as leaves in the winds of autumn, and in winter as a star upon a hill, but a chain was upon his limbs. There came a time near dawn on the eve of spring, and Luthien danced upon a green hill, and suddenly she began to sing. Keen, heart-piercing was her song as the song of the lark that rises from the gates of night and pours its voice among the dying stars seeing the sun behind the walls of the world. And the song of Luthien released the bonds of winter, and the frozen waters spoke, and flowers sprang from the cold earth where her feet had passed. Then the spell of silence fell from Beren, and he called to her, crying to Nuvio, and the woods echoed the name. Then she halted in wonder, and fled no more, and Beren came to her, but as she looked on him, doom fell upon her, and she loved him. Yet she slipped away from his arms, and vanished from his sight, even as the day was breaking. Then Beren lay upon the ground in a swoon, as one slain at once by bliss and grief. And he fell into a sleep, as it were into an abyss of shadow. And waking, he was cold as stone, and his heart barren and forsaken. And wandering in mind, he groped as one that is stricken with sudden blindness, and seeks with hands to grasp the vanished light. Thus he began the payment of anguish for the fate that was laid on him. And in his fate, Luthien was caught. And being immortal, she shared in his mortality and being free received his chain, and her anguish was greater than any other of the elder Leah has known. Beyond his hope she returned to him, where he sat in darkness, and long ago in the hidden kingdom she laid her hand in his. Thereafter often she came to him, and they went in secret through the woods together from spring to summer, and no others of the children of Iluvatar have had joy so great, though the time was brief. But Dairon, the minstrel, also loved Luthien, and he espied her meeting with Beren, and betrayed them to Thingol. 
Then the king was filled with anger, for Luthien he loved above all things, setting her above all the princes of the elves, whereas mortal men he did not even take into his service. Therefore he spoke in grief and amazement to Luthien, but she would reveal nothing until he swore an oath to her that he would neither slay Beren nor imprison him. But he sent his servants to lay hands on him and lead him to Menegroth as a malefactor. And Luthien forestalling them led Beren herself before the throne of Thingol, as if he were an honoured guest. Then Thingol looked upon Beren in scorn and anger, but Melion was silent. Who are you, said the king, that come hither as a thief, and unbidden dare to approach my throne? But Beren, being filled with dread, for the splendour of Menegroth and the majesty of Thingol were very great, answered nothing. Therefore Luthien spoke and said, He is Beren, son of Barahir, lord of men, mighty foe of Morgoth, the tale of whose deeds is become a song even among the elves. Let Beren speak, said Thingol. What would you hear, unhappy mortal? For what cause have you left your own land to enter this, which is forbidden to such as you? Can you show reason why my power should not be laid on you in heavy punishment for your insolence and folly? Then Beren, looking up, beheld the eyes of Luthien, and his glance went also to the face of Melian and it seemed to him that words were put into his mouth. Fear left him, and the pride of the eldest house of men returned to him, and he said, My fate, O king, led me hither, through perils such as few even of the elves would dare. And here I have found what I sought not indeed, but finding I would possess for ever for it is above all gold and silver, and beyond all jewels, neither rock nor steel, nor the files of Morgoth, nor all the powers of the elf kingdoms shall keep from me the treasure that I desire. For Luthien, your daughter, is the fairest of all the children of the world. Then silence fell upon the hall, for those that stood there were astounded and afraid, and they thought that Beren would be slain. But Thingol spoke slowly, saying, Death you have earned with these words, and death you should find suddenly, had I not sworn an oath in haste, of which I repent, base-born mortal who in the realm of Morgoth has learnt to creep in secret as his spies and thralls. Then Beren answered, Death you can give me earned or unearned, but the names I will not take from you of baseborn, nor spy, nor thrall, by the ring of Felagund that he gave to Barahir, my father, on the battlefield of the north. My house has not earned such names from any elf, be he king or no. His words were proud, and all eyes looked upon the ring, for he held it now aloft, and the green jewels gleamed there that the Noldor had devised in Valinor. For this ring was like two twin serpents, whose eyes were emeralds, and their heads met beneath a crown of golden flowers, that the one upheld and the other devoured. That was the badge of Finarfin and his house. Then Melian leaned to Thingol's side, and in whispered counsel bade him forego his wrath. For not by you, she said, shall Beren be slain, and far and free does his fate lead him in the end. Yet it is wound with yours. Take heed. But Thingol looked in silence upon Luthien, and he thought in his heart, Unhappy men! children of little lords and brief kings, shall such as these lay hands on you and yet live? 
Then breaking the silence, he said, I see the ring, son of Barahir, and I perceive that you are proud and deem yourself mighty. But a father's deeds, even had his service been rendered to me, avail not to win the daughter of Thingol and Melion. See now, I too desire a treasure that is withheld, for rock and steel and the fires of Morgoth keep the jewel that I would possess against all the powers of the Elf Kingdoms. Yet I hear you say that bonds such as these do not daunt you. Go your way, therefore. Bring to me in your hand a Sumeru from Morgoth's crown, and then, if she will, Luthien may set her hand in yours. Then you shall have my jewel, and though the fate of Arda lie within the Sumerus, yet you shall hold me generous. Thus he wrought the doom of Doria, and was ensnared within the curse of Mandos. And those that heard these words perceived that Thingol would save his oath, and yet send Beren to his death, for they knew that not all the power of the Noldor before the siege was broken had availed even to see from afar the shining Silmarinals of Feanor, for they were set in the iron crown and treasured in Engband above all wealth. And Balrogs were about them, and countless swords, and strong bars, and unassailable walls, and the dark majesty of Morgoth. But Beren laughed, for little price, he said, do elven kings sell their daughters, for gems and things made by craft. But if this be your will, Thingol, I will perform it, and when we meet again, my hand shall hold a Silmaril from the Iron Crown, for you have not looked the last upon Beren, son of Barahir. Then he looked in the eyes of Melion, who spoke not, and he bade farewell to Luthien and to Nuvia. And bowing before Thingol and Melion, he put aside the guards about him, and departed from Menegroth alone. Then at last Melion spoke, and she said to Thingol, O king, you have devised cunning counsel, but if my eyes have not lost their sight, it is ill for you whether Baron fail in his errand or achieve it. For you have doomed either your daughter or yourself, and now is Doriath drawn within the fate of a mightier realm. But Thingol answered, I sow not to elves or men those whom I love and cherish above all treasure, and if there were hope or fear that Baron should come ever back alive to Menegroth, he should not have looked again upon the light of heaven though I had sworn it. But Luthien was silent, and from that hour she sang not again in Doriath. A brooding silence fell upon the woods, and the shadows lengthened in the kingdom of Thingol. It is told in the Lay of Lethion that Beren passed through Doriath unhindered, and came at length to the region of the twilight mirrors and the fens of Sirion. And leaving Thingol's land, he climbed the hills above the falls of Sirion, where the river plunged underground with great noise. Thence he looked westward, and through the mist and rains that lay upon those hills, he saw Talath Dianan, the guarded plain, stretching between Sirion and Norog. And beyond he descried afar the highlands of Tar and Faroth, that rose above Nargothrond, and being destitute, without hope or counsel, he turned his feet thither. Upon all that plain the elves of Nargothrond kept unceasing watch, and every hill upon its borders was crowned with hidden towers, and through all its woods and fields archers ranged secretly, and with great craft. Their arrows were sure and deadly, and nothing crept there against their will. Therefore, ere Beren had come far upon his road, 
they were aware of him, and his death was nigh. But knowing his danger, he held aloft the ring of Felagon, and though he saw no living thing, because of the stealth of the hunters, he felt that he was watched, and cried often aloud, I am Baron, son of Barahir, friend of Felagund. Take me to the king. Therefore the hunters slew him not, but assembling, they waylaid him, and commanded him to halt. But seeing the ring, they bowed before him, though he was in evil plight, wild and wayworn. And they led him northward and westward, going by night, lest their paths should be revealed. For at that time there was no ford or bridge over the torrent of Narog before the gates of Nargothrond, but further to the north, where Ginglith joined Nagrog, the flood was less, and crossing there, and turning again south with the elves led Baron under the light of the moon to the dark gates of their hidden halls. Thus Baron came before King Finrod Felagund, and Felagund knew him, needing no ring to remind him of the kin of Beor and of Barahir. Behind closed doors they sat, and Beren told of the death of Barahir, and of all that had befallen him in Doriath. And he wept, recalling Luthien and their joy together. But Felagund heard this tale in wonder and disquiet, and he knew that the oath he had sworn was come upon him for his death, as long before he had foretold to Galadriel. He spoke then to Beren in heaviness of heart. It is plain that Thingle desires your death, but it seems that this doom goes beyond his purpose, and that the oath of Fëanor is again at work. For the Silmarils are cursed with an oath of hatred, and he that even names them in desire moves a great power from slumber. And the sons of Fëanor would lay all the elf kingdoms in ruin rather than suffer any other than themselves to win or possess a Silmaril, for the oath drives them. And now Kelagorm and Kurufen are dwelling in my halls, and though I, Finarfin's son, am king, they have won a strong power in the realm, and lead many of their own people. They have shown friendship to me in every need, but I fear that they will show neither love nor mercy to you if your quest be told. Yet my own oath holds, and thus we are all ensnared. Then King Philagon spoke before his people, recalling the deeds of Barahir and his vow, and he declared that it was laid upon him to aid the son of Barahir in his need, and he sought the help of his chieftains. Then Caligorm arose amid the throng, and drawing his sword he cried, be he friend or foe, whether demon of Morgoth, or elf, or child of men, or any living thing in Arda, neither law, nor love, nor league of hell, nor might of the Valar, nor any power of wizardry, shall defend him from the pursuing hate of Fëanor's sons, if he take or find a Silmaril and keep it. But the Silmarils we alone claim until the world ends. Many other words he spoke, as potent as were long before in Tyrion the words of his father, the first inflamed the Noldor to rebellion. And after Kelagorm Kurufin spoke, more softly, but with no less power, conjuring in the minds of the elves a vision of war and the ruin of Nargothrond. So great a fear did he set in their hearts, that never after until the time of Turin would any elf of that realm go into open battle? But with stealth and ambush, with wizardry and venom dart, they pursued all strangers, forgetting the bonds of kinship. Thus they fell from the valour and freedom of the elves of old, and their land was darkened. And now they murmured that Finarfin's son was not as a valour to command them and they turned their faces from him. But the curse of Mandos came upon the brothers, 
and dark thoughts arose in their hearts, thinking to send forth Felagund alone to his death, and to usurp it might be the throne of Norgothrond, for they were of the oldest line of the princes of the Noldor. And Felagund, seeing that he was forsaken, took from his head the silver crown of Norgothrond, and cast it at his feet, saying, Your oaths of faith to me you may break, but I must hold my bond. Yet, if there be any on whom the shadow of our curse has not yet fallen, I should find at least a few to follow me, and should not go hence as a beggar that is thrust from the gates. There were ten that stood by him, and the chief of them, who was named Edrahil, stooping, lifted the crown, and asked that it be given to a steward until Felagund's return. For you remain my king, and theirs, he said, whatever betide. Then Felagund gave the crown of Nargothron to Orodreth, his brother, to govern in his stead. And Caligorm and Kurufin said nothing, but they smiled and went from the halls. On an evening of autumn, Felagund and Beren set out from Nargothrond with their ten companions, and they journeyed beside Narog to his source in the falls of Ivrin. Beneath the shadowy mountains they came upon a company of orcs, and slew them all in their camp by night. And they took their gear and their weapons. By the arts of Felagund, their own forms and faces were changed into the likeness of orcs, and thus disguised, they came far upon their northern road, and ventured into the western pass, between Edidwethrin and the highlands of tar Nufuin. But Sauron, in his tower, was ware of them, and doubt took him, for they went in haste, and stayed not to report their deeds, as was commanded to all the servants of Morgoth that passed that way. Therefore he sent to waylay them, and bring them before him. Thus befell the contest of Sauron and Felagund, which is renowned. For Felagund strove with Sauron in songs of power, and the power of the king was very great. But Sauron had the mastery, as is told in the Lay of Lethia. He chanted a song of wizardry, of piercing, opening of treachery, revealing, uncovering, betraying. Then sudden Felagund there swaying, saying in answer a song of staying, persisting, battling against power, of secrets kept, strength like a tower, and trust unbroken, freedom, escape, of changing and of shifting shape, of snares eluded, broken traps, the prison opening, the chain that snaps. Backwards and forwards swayed their song, reeling of foundering as ever more strong. The chanting swelled, Felagund fought, and all the magic and might he brought of Elveness into his words. Softly in the gloom they heard the birds, singing afar in Nargothrond, the sighing of the sea beyond, beyond the western world, on sand, on sand of pearls in elven land. In the gloom gathered, darkness growing, in Valinor the red blood flowing, beside the sea where the Noldor slew, the foam riders and stealing drew their white ships with their white sails, from lamplit havens the wind wails, the wolf howls, the ravens flee, the ice mutters in the mouths of the sea, the captives sad and angbad mourn, thunder rumbles, the fires burn, and Finrod fell before the throne. Then Sauron stripped from them their disguise, and they stood before him naked and afraid. But though their kinds were revealed, Sauron could not discover their names or their purposes. He cast them therefore into a deep pit, dark and silent, and threatened to slay them cruelly, unless one would betray the truth to him. From time to time they saw two eyes kindled in the dark, and a werewolf devoured one of the companions, 
but none betrayed their lord. In the time when Sauron cast Beren into the pit, a weight of horror came upon Luthien's heart, and going to Melian for counsel, she learned that Beren lay in the dungeons of Tol in Garhoth, without hope of rescue. Then Luthien, perceiving that no help would come from any other on earth, resolved to fly from Doriath and come herself to him. But she sought the aid of Dairon, and he betrayed her purpose to the king. Then Thingol was filled with fear and wonder, and because he would not deprive Luthien of the lights of heaven, lest she fail and fade, and yet would restrain her, he caused a house to be built from which she could not escape. Not far from the gates of Menegroth stood the greatest of all the trees in the forest of Noldoreth, and that was a beech forest at the northern half of the kingdom. This mighty beech was named Hirilon, and it had three trunks, equal in girth, smooth in rind, and exceeding tall. No branches grew from them for a great height above the ground. Far aloft, between the shafts of Hirilon, a wooden house was built, and there Luthien was made to dwell, and the ladders were taken away and guarded, save only when the servants of Thingol brought her such things as she needed. It is told in the Lave Lethion how she escaped from the house of Hedilon, for she put forth her arts of enchantment, and caused her hair to grow to great length, and of it she wove a dark robe that wrapped her beauty like a shadow, and it was laden with a spell of sleep. Of the strands that remained she twined a rope, and she let it down from her window, and as the end swayed above the guards that sat beneath the tree, they fell into a deep slumber. Then Luthien climbed from her prison, and shrouded in her shadowy cloak, she escaped from all eyes, and vanished out of Doriath. It chanced that Kelogorm and Kurufin went on a hunt through the guarded plain, and this they did because Sauron, being filled with suspicion, sent forth many wolves into the elflands. Therefore they took their hounds and rode forth, and they thought that ere they returned they might also hear tidings concerning King Felagond. Now the chief of the wolfhounds that followed Kelogorm was named Huan. He was not born in Middle-earth, but came from the blessed realm, for Orme had given him to Kelagorm long ago in Valinor, and there he had followed the horn of his master before evil came. Huon followed Kelagorm into exile, and was faithful, and thus he too came under the doom of woe set upon the Noldor, and it was decreed that he should meet death, but not until he encountered the mightiest wolf that would ever walk the world. Huon it was that found Luthien flying like a shadow surprised by the daylight under the trees when Kelagorm and Kurufin rested a while near to the western eaves of Doria. For nothing could escape the sight and scent of Huon, nor could any enchantment stay him, and he slept not, neither by day nor night. He brought her to Kelagorm, and Luthien, learning that he was a prince of the Noldor and a foe of Morgoth, was glad and she declared herself, casting aside her cloak. So great was her sudden beauty revealed beneath the sun that Kelagorm became enamoured of her. But he spoke her fair, and promised that she would find help in her need if she returned with him now to Nargothrond. By no sign did he reveal that he knew already of Beren and the quest of which she told, nor that it was a matter which touched him near. Thus they broke off the hunt and returned to Norgothrond, and Luthien was betrayed, for they held her fast and took away her cloak, and she was not permitted to pass the gates or to speak with any save the brothers Kelagorm and Kurufin. For now, believing that Beren and Felagund were prisoners beyond hope of aid, they purposed to let the king perish and to keep Luthien and force Thingol to give her hand to Kelagorm. Thus they would advance their power and become the mightiest of the princes of the Noldor. 
and they did not purpose to seek the Silmarils by craft or war, or to suffer any others to do so, until they had all the might of the Elf Kingdoms under their hands. Orodreth had no power to withstand them, for they swayed the hearts of the people of Nargathron, and Kelagorm sent messengers to Thingol urging his suit. But Huon the Hound was true of heart, and the love of Luthien had fallen upon him in the first hour of their meeting, and he grieved at her captivity. Therefore he came often to her chamber, and at night he lay before her door, for he felt that evil had come to Nargothrond. Luthien spoke often to Huon in her loneliness, telling of Beren, who was the friend of all birds and beasts that did not serve Morgoth. And Huon understood all that was said, for he comprehended the speech of all things with voice, but it was permitted to him thrice only ere his death to speak with words. Now Huon devised a plan for the aid of Luthien, and coming at time of night he brought her cloak, and for the first time he spoke, giving her counsel. Then he led her by secret ways out of Nargothrond, and they fled north together, and he humbled his pride, and suffered her to ride upon him in the fashion of a steed, even as the orcs did at times upon great wolves. Thus they made great speed, for Huon was swift and tireless. In the pits of Sauron, Beren and Felagund lay, and all their companions were now dead. But Sauron purposed to keep Felagund to the last, for he perceived that he was a Noldo of great might and wisdom, and he deemed that in him lay the secret of their errand. But when the wolf came for Beren, Felagund put forth all his power and burst his bonds, and he wrestled with the werewolf and slew it with his hands and teeth. Yet he himself was wounded to the death. Then he spoke to Beren, saying, I go now to my long rest in the timeless holes beyond the seas and the mountains of Amman. It will be long ere I am seen among the Noldor again, and it may be that we shall not meet a second time in death or life, for the fates of our kindreds are apart. Farewell. He died then in the dark, in Tol in Garoth, whose great tower he himself had built. Thus King Finrod Felagund, fairest and most beloved of the house of Finway, redeemed his oath. But Beren mourned beside him in despair. In that hour Luthien came, and standing upon the bridge that led to Sauron's isle, she sang a song that no wall of stone could hinder. Beren heard, and he thought that he dreamed, for the stars shone above him, and in the trees nightingales were singing. And in answer he sang a song of challenge that he had made in praise of the seven stars, the sickle of the Valar that Varda hung above the north as a sign for the fall of Morgoth. Then all strength left him, and he fell down into darkness. But Luthien heard his answering voice, and she sang then a song of greater power. The wolves howled, and the isle trembled. Sauron stood in the high tower, wrapped in his black thought. But he smiled hearing her voice, for he knew that it was the daughter of Melion. The fame of the beauty of Luthien and the wonder of her song had long gone forth from Doriath, and he thought to make her captive and hand her over to the power of Morgoth, for his reward would be great. Therefore he sent a wolf to the bridge, but Huon slew it silently. Still Sauron sent others one by one, and one by one Huon took them by the throat and slew them. Then Sauron sent Draugluin, a dread beast old in evil, lord and sire of the werewolves of Engband. His might was great, and the battle of Huon and Draugluin was long and fierce, 
Yet at length Draugluin escaped, and fling back into the tower, he died before Sauron's feet. And as he died, he told his master, Huon is there. Now Sauron knew well, as did all in that land, the fate that was decreed for the Hound of Valinor, and it came into his thought that he himself would accomplish it. Therefore he took upon himself the form of a werewolf, and made himself the mightiest that had yet walked the world, and he came forth to win the passage of the bridge.